Effectively securing your organization and its reputation requires a smarter approach. To maximize efficiency and minimize risk, security experts turn to Logarithm, the only leading solution built solely for security teams by a security team committed to your success. With NextGen SIM, user and entity behavior analytics, network traffic and behavior analysis, security automation and orchestration, and compliance, Logarithm provides security made smarter. Let the team at Black Hills Information Security test your defenses. With over 10 years of experience in penetration testing, red teaming, and threat hunting, the testers at Black Hills will help you find the holes in your security before the bad guys do. The team at Black Hills cares about educating and sharing their knowledge by creating countless blogs, open source tools, and webcasts for you to learn more about the tradecraft of pen testing and red teaming. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash BHIS to join their mailing list and view the latest blogs and webcasts from Black Hills Information Security. The biggest problem in security that remains unsolved is unprotected attack paths that allow threats to compromise vulnerable targets in the cloud and data center. But traditional micro-segmentation is too complex and time-consuming. There's a better approach. Edgewise Zero Trust Auto Segmentation. Edgewise is impossibly simple micro-segmentation, delivering results immediately with a security outcome that's provable and management that's zero touch. Driven by machine learning, Edgewise automatically builds policies that protect any application in any cloud without any changes to your network. They provide measurable improvement by quantifying attack path risk reduction and verifying software identity before it communicates to stop application compromises and data breaches. To see how to eliminate your network attack surface, visit securityweekly.com forward slash edgewise. Welcome back everyone to Balls of Security Weekly. Who knows what's in store for this segment? Because to be honest, the news was, was kind of kind of eh this week. Oh, so we can eh. make it exciting. Don't this, worry. I know. Oh, don't worry. This is oh be, just <laughs> let me go. Look out. Uh, so uh, I've got a, a few things to, that will kind of lead us hopefully in the right direction. Uh, mark your calendars for the Security Weekly Holiday Extravaganza. What you missed during the break was that Dave will be, I believe, in our pen test uh, segment that we're airing on uh, December 19th. And so there'll be five, five round tables, five round tables, five one Plus round Ed tables. Scotus. Five. and Ed Scotus. We just keep recruiting people for these round tables too. Uh, which so there's one on uh, hacker history, which our listeners know I've been uh, preparing for uh, by reading Hackers: Heroes of the Revolution, a Computer Revolution by Stephen Levy. Uh, which I tell you what, the book was published in 1984. And I'm listening to it now, and I'm like, wow, like, there are so many like, things. so still applicable. I think about all the times <laughs> in my hacking career, so to speak. I'm like, it really is all kind of coming full uh, circle. And there will also be one on AppSec, one on pen testing, one on security versus compliance, one. What pen else? test, blue team. Blue team. Yep, blue so team. So the one I forget. We got to do red team and blue team. We got to do red and blue. We got history, uh, DevSecOps, and then compliance. It's going to be awesome. Those are the five. Yes. Live streaming for five uh, panels plus Ed Scotus's, of course, the. It's annual. like six hours of streaming on Sit the 19th. Today, I mean, we could add more. To be, I mean, we've broadcast for longer than that. Uh -huh. and so we just continue to add <laughs> things. Uh, to that, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a party, but in traditional Security Weekly fashion, a party is we record lots of podcasts. So yeah, and we record them with lots of food and drink, so they'll always be entertaining. Mark your calendars, December nineteenth. Uh, it's how we're rounding out the year, uh, basically bringing all our friends together to talk about uh, relevant security topics. Yeah, so. uh, securityweekly.com forward slash live or the YouTube live stream. It's gonna be you awesome. You can watch it. John's gonna make collard greens. Uh, just you know, I'm going to appear as drunk Uncle Steve, who voted for Gus Hall. <laughs> Santa may or may not be in the house. I'm just saying. I don't know. That's true. We might dress up. Uh, I I want to start with um, this article uh, that I'm kind of flipping through to to draw on some discussion points. Thirteen security pros share their most valuable experiences. Uh, and two folks that. I know Alan Liska's definitely been on the show. He's been on the show. He's been on this specific show, Brian, sitting right over there. Brian so. Vecchi, I want to say I've done a briefing with from Veronis. Um, both note that they got their start at the help desk. And I, I think this is an important topic to uh, come back to as we talk about the community, getting into InfoSec, DerbyCon communities, that I, I certainly got my start on, on a help desk. I did a lot of user support and it, it's so important today i i don't think 
and, and I, I may get crap for this, but you can come out of college with no experience with a degree and go, I'm going to do InfoSec. I really think you need to spend time in various disciplines. You need to understand how to, how to build stuff, uh, how to break stuff, and, and how to secure stuff, which are three totally different things that you need to have experiences in to be a truly effective information security well, you, professional, regardless yes. of where you're going. I'd also throw in there a fourth discipline of development today. As we talk about infrastructure as code, you're going to need some type of development, development experience. Yep. I just got, I'll be honest with you, I got lucky. My parents, when I was seven years old, signed me up for a programming class. And I was like, well, this is really awesome. I get to tell the computer what to do. And thankfully, I forget who created BASIC. It's in my book. I'll make sure I write that down. There is a person <laughs> who created BASIC who was like, look, this Fortran and Lisp thing is really cool, but I want like to lower the bar as to what you need to know to be able to program a computer right. and create a BASIC. And thank God that they did because it turned so many people on to creating software and use more natural language to describe as much as you want to make fun I mean, of go to and in other you know types of you know elements of a language <clears throat> it did allow more people to come in and create software yeah. so development is important learning how to build things is important learning how to break things is important and learning how to deploy things securely is almost a fourth discipline. Yeah, I mean, I got lucky it's too. I was pretty lucky in um, the disciplines I went through, right? I, I, I knew in seventh grade, and people will think I'm, I'm just absolutely crazy. I knew in seventh grade I wanted to be an electrical engineer. That was, the, that was my career. And, and during high school, I, I took every class, math, physics. I took mm -hmm. basic programming. I took all these disciplines. I wanted to be an electrical engineer. And um, I, I went into nuclear power. I spent seven and a half years in nuclear power um, r really early in my career. And, and it, you know, learned all these aspects of how the electrical system works, right? Generation, power, et cetera. Um, and then I got this really uh, lucky opportunity to go into the computer group. And um, I, I had programming experience, but it was more from a product management perspective, mm -hmm. what we used to call project management back in the day mm -hmm. in the early days uh and building yeah, real time i think you're right a lot of product management was project project management, management yeah. right we were building requirements for a real-time computer system upgrade to the plant so that the plant could get um advanced io to run the nuclear power plant and and, and you know it, it was great because i learned a ton about computers and i was working with VAX 11780s and PDP 1144s and replacing these systems and building all this stuff. And I went, ooh, this is really cool. I want to go get, you, if you grow up in the electrical side, you learn the physical side of electronics, right? Uh, uh, JK Frip Props, um, my professor was uh, Japanese and, and it was always a Frip Prop. And, and so you learn all the physical stuff. And then I went, wait a minute, if I'm going to go into computers, I better learn the other side of this, the software side, and, and went and got my master's in computer engineering and, and did a lot with databases and programming and stuff. And I haven't done coding in a long time. I mean, literally, since 96. I, I wrote my master's project was in C++ and, and building all that stuff. But I learned a ton from that, building your own assembler, et cetera. And then... Um, you know, when I decided to leave the plant, I had all this really interesting experience and, and, and kind of fell into security, actually, because mm -hmm. I, I had built... Like many of us. Right. I had built a number of systems and requirements for systems, and then you got into the security space, and you were deploying antivirus and IPS and firewalls and all this other fun stuff, and my career kind of... I, but pure dumb luck, because I was going to go be an electrical engineer guy. I could be sitting in a nuclear power plant still today, you know, producing electricity. Mm -hmm. um, so what you take as your initial education isn't necessarily where you'll end up. Um, but if you learn a set of capabilities, then you can use those to actually move and, and transform your career. Um, I, I decided I wasn't going to be a developer. Um, thank God probably for all the developers out there that I'm not coding for today. For nuclear power. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, you never know what, 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 what the plants would do. Um, yeah, but eventually but Loki brought you the Tesseract and power was an yeah, issue. Yeah, no power wasn't an issue. But, you know, so I, I kind of fell into this too, right? And so 
everybody can start a security career from a different place. They yes. don't have to start with a cybersecurity degree. They can start with <laughs> almost pretty much any engineering or IT discipline. Or not. And, or not. Um, and move into cybersecurity and understanding the basics of system administration, database administration, maybe some coding. They all have relevant roles in our space. And you, you know what's interesting? To that point, like some of the most technical computer scientists that I met it, did had a degree in physics. But in yeah. order to do what they needed to do and wanted to do in physics, they had to learn computer science. It's kind of an offshoot. So... There is no like one set path, and mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I laid out kind of four elements, right? But there's no one set path. Kevin O'Brien from Great Horn was describing earlier that he's philosophy. He had a degree in philosophy, and it, he's not the first person to tell me I got a degree in philosophy, and I ended up in computer security. I was in the military. I ended up in security, but, right? But there's, like, a I, there's so thing. many ways in. So I, I don't believe in luck. I think you make your own luck, and and I have a similar story I could tell to, to what you guys told, but. It's just a lot older, but I mean, at some point you have the common theme is mileage. You you have to put in the mileage it's to get experience. to where you want to be. Doug, where was your experience? Was it PDP eleven? Seven, eleven, seven, eleven. Which was, and seven was the first Unix? Yeah. arguably the first Unix. Oh no, computer. I meant the actual seven, eleven. So oh, 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 oh. <laughs> no, I, well, PDP no. seven was Ken Thompson's. Yeah, crack at that's some Unix, old stuff. Right? Old yeah. stuff. And, and then you know in the P in the PDP eleven and then I, I worked yeah. I, I we didn't call it the help desk we called it the abuse desk but <laughs> um, I, I mean but it was still mileage it was about yep. being there it was about you know twelve Putting hour in your time. fifteen hour days yeah and and one of the things I try to tell people today I, I get asked this question like, how do I get where all of you are mm -hmm. how, how do I how do I be Dave Kennedy how do I be Tyler how do I be these things. And, and it's tough because you, you have to put that mileage in somewhere. You don't get that in a, a, a three-credit college course. No. Mm -hmm. You've got to right. put in that mileage behind the scenes. You've got to be building things and breaking things and fixing those things that you broke and then doing all that again. And, and that's how all the people that you're seeing here got here was through mileage. It wasn't necessarily through luck. It, it was through, I mean, luck helps, but I don't, I don't believe in it. But I mean, you made it happen. You know, you said I want to be a programmer. You could have, you could have gone down and said I'm, I'm yeah. just going to be a drunk, and which was the choice I made. But, but I mean, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, you had to put that mileage in and write that code and spend that time answering calls. And and one of the dangers of all this is it, it looks so fun and easy, but it's really not. I mean, I mean, it's not a montage. There's always this behind the scenes part where people were sitting there working and writing code. And fixing those mainframes. I think I said to Matt this morning that uh, I, 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 while I wanted to set out to be the mo world's most talented engineer, I realized I probably wouldn't reach that goal. But if I could be one of the most persistent hackers, well, that's, that's where that's I want to. That's a good word. Persistence. Persistence is a good word. It's I mean, that's so the same, important. It's right? the same word as mileage. I yeah. mean, in almost anything you want to do, it's about mileage. I mean, and remember, when we came up through these ranks, there was no cybersecurity degree. No. There was no. no discipline for security. It was some other discipline that security was a complete, like, unknown mm -hmm. adjacency to that. Now you got people coming up through with cybersecurity degrees expecting they're they're going to go do all the greatest things maybe not maybe but it, it doesn't necessarily have to start there either right. uh tyler yeah that's that's why the i think there's such a shortage of uh cybersecurity professionals and and we see this huge gap with inside the market right now is people don't realize and the the industry doesn't realize academia doesn't realize that they can't just send someone through a you know, four credit class, a semester of cybersecurity, and boom, you've got the same level of effort that, you know, the rest of us have put decades of behind the scenes work, that that tenacity and that behind the scenes work, everybody thinks that even, you know, physical pen tests, uh, outside of the digital side, they think it's all sexy, glamorous, easy to do until they're the ones on the ground, 
uh, you've got teams waiting for access and you're you know sweating bullets trying to figure out how to how to get into somewhere there's you know thousands of hours of research skills and tooling to know how to do that kind of stuff and you know sleepless nights you know many of us don't sleep for more than than three hours because we're consistently having to improve our skills keep up with the latest techniques build the latest techniques and, and do the research and that's not the glamorous side and people coming out of college want to earn the same have the same respect and, and level that the rest of us have put you know decades of time behind and think that it's just an easy game to get to now we don't want to discourage those people from coming up and, and building those ranks but like you said the mileage the time you have to put in your your due diligence i, I would recommend anybody trying to get in, in into infosec my first recommendation is go be a sysadmin you're not going to know yeah. the mistakes you're not going to know the shortcuts you're not going to know the platforms or the tooling uh, and how those are deployed in an enterprise unless you've done it and, and put that work in. You're not going to know the mistakes that these people have made. And that's what's going to make you the better pen tester and long term be a better security. Yeah, it could be uh, sysadmin. It could so be the, the network article, admin. The article also talks about non-technical fields. Mark Rogers, uh, a name you might recognize, right? And someone who I very much want to have on the show. Uh, how he's escaped us over the years, I, I don't know. Um, but... He got a degree in psychology and was a bouncer. And that yes. study of human behavior, right. Mark is not so the hopefully. only one we've seen get into our field that you don't necessarily need an engineering or technical background. Human or, behavior or is such, right, Tyler, a huge part of our field. Yeah, knowing how to talk to customers, having that business mindset, knowing what uh, return on investment means for the executive level, understanding how departments work and, and how inter politics work with inside of an organization, being able to speak the lingo of, of executives and, and really know what they're looking for and how they are moving big levers and big wheels in order to move an organization. You have to have that, that business aptitude and that, that understanding of, of what the client really needs and be able to articulate that. Otherwise, you're just going to be one of the guys in the basement that you know has been rambling something that no one else understands and, and you <laughs> expect people to pay attention but to. Another, but, also, but also hacking the human is very much a part of what we do. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, the other story in here is Ann Johnson, right? And I worked with Ann at RSA, and she went to Qualys, and now she's at Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ann started um, on the healthcare side at mm -hmm. Data General from a more of a storage perspective. She came up through the network and storage ranks, went to um, identity from a PKI perspective, at, and she ran uh, a big portion of, of the RSA practice. So I got to work with Ann for uh, a on about a year, year and a half when she was at RSA. Um, and now she's running all the, a lot of the stuff at Microsoft, right? I mean, people came through various ranks, right? And so there is no preset course to get into this industry. They can come from various angles, whether it's psychology. I, I even know CISOs that were, were, were music folks, right? But have this really great aptitude around but, math but and, and some theme. of the other things. There's a theme, and I, I say this all the time at, in academics, and 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 I, I want our academics to try to prepare people to enter this field, not not to jump in at, at high levels, but there's a theme. And the theme I tell them all the time is, you have to like this. Yeah. The one commonality <laughs> I could show you across everybody sitting here, everybody watching out there on, on, the, on the screen, is they like it. They're taking their time to, to get involved. They're taking their time to, to learn new things because you're gonna have to learn every day for the rest of your career. Because mm -hmm. when you stop learning in this field, you're your done. career is done. You're done. You can quit now. You can go sit on an island or whatever you've managed to do or go live in a cardboard box or wherever, whatever level you, you've, you've achieved, but you have to like it. Because I get people all the time going, this is, a, this is a good way to make money, right? I don't really like computers. I've had people say that to me. And I'm like, what? And they're like, I mean, cyber is like easy, right? I mean, that's like the flesh of Emma. Like, yeah, that's why they pay people well, because it's easy. You know, that, that's why. I mean, you have to really get into it. It has to be the thing that you do. That's, I mean, I mean, you'll see that with musicians. 
musicians don't just go, oh, I played a show, I go home, and I put my guitar in the case, and I never touch yeah. it again until the right. next show. They go home after the show, and they're like, man, I, you know, I think this is a little thing, and they, they play all the time. They never right. stop playing. They're and, constantly and, being creative. And people here do the same thing. They go home and go, man, I wonder how you do that. I heard mm -hmm. that guy talk about that thing, and I wonder how I could do that. And they start trying to figure it out, and they start trying to solve the problem. And maybe you, you can't. Maybe you can't figure it out. And then you go out and you look at shows, and you listen to other people in the industry who have done things like that and maybe you do come up with something new or maybe you just manage the status quo but you got to like it you got to have it you, as don't, a, as you don't have to like it you have to love it well gotta yeah. Love it. yeah i think our significant others would would agree like they <laughs> they get annoyed they don't understand like when do you shut your brain off like when do you stop i mean i used to tell my my employers you guys don't you guys don't pay me to be here like i would do this for free all day you yeah. guys pay me to write reports. You probably do, <laughs> right? I mean, you do it for free. I, I all the time. I mean, I, you I know, mean the I, amount of it, it, so just just give you an example, right? We do seven podcasts a week. Think about all the research and prep that goes into every single one of those podcasts. I don't think people understand what it takes to prepare for a podcast. It's something you draw on from your life, not yes. something that you do as a job, right? And right. you do it. Right, it, you know, I was I was explaining the story earlier today. I'm I, I on Sundays I sit down in front of the the game and and I watch my Broncos get destroyed, or blow a game or whatever it is. But I, I'm there and I'm preparing for Monday shows, right? Because it has to be done. You got to go research the articles. Yeah. You got to pull the information together. If you don't love it. If you don't absolutely love what you're doing, you're not doing that on a Sunday watching the football game. You're not. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you love it, you're finding a way. Every Saturday and Sunday, I'm, I'm just sorry, you are, right? You are doing aspects of your job, even on the weekends when you're not officially paid to do it. I, I, you but know, how many things I do Tyler's on Saturdays point, right? and Sundays I and think doing all this stuff. Like, how do you get to the point oh where my you God, work My wife less. can't and, stand it. But my whole thing is... I'm like, how do I get to the point where I can work more? Because I really love what I do. Right. right? I, I, yeah. I want to spend time with my family. Obviously, I, I love that too. But how do I continue to balance, balance that? Balance? I like, mean, when my daughter was little, I was like, those little fingers would really help putting this ram in this yeah. case. And she's like, ooh, cool. And I'm like, yeah, right. let's build this firewall, honey. And, you know, she's like, is this fun? I'm like, it's great. It's You're going to love it. My so kids never fun. got into that. But to me, there's something about. Doing the research, doing the time, and it doesn't matter what day or what time it is. It could be at eight o'clock at night. It could yeah. be it's not six, a, it's six, not five o'clock in the morning, like yeah. you. It, it could be on a Saturday and a Sunday. You are doing the things you love to prepare for that next thing. Um, and when you have two podcasts on Monday, which I do, which is ASW and BSW, I got to be ready to go because mon my Mondays are nuts. Just completely nuts from a scheduling perspective. We do our sales call. I do a, a show. I got a little break. I do another show. My Mondays are like packed. And if I don't spend the time on the weekend to really prepare, those shows are going to suck. And But I want those shows to be successful. And so I take the time and, and find the time to really do that. And if that's the passion you have then this is a great industry for you. If you yeah. don't have that passion, it's a lot harder to succeed. But if in this you don't space. want to learn something, I mean, like today, I, I was looking, I was watching this video, and um, it, it was about packing and and unpacking, and I was realizing how much my assembler skills had atrophied, <laughs> you know, and and I was like, oh hell, and you know, and I I was literally down there in my other office digging out an old assembler book and going, I really need to get back up to speed on this, and you know, and and and. And, and you, I, I think that that's that mileage that just kind of keeps going, and there's not this nice jumping off point where you go, I'm done, you know, I got I'm it. I'm done. You know, I've got I, enough knowledge, I'm done. I'm just going to walk on and, and not be prepared. No, 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 no. you got to be prepared no matter what it is, that task in life. And it's going to change. It, it, it obviously will Next change. Next week it'll be something different. It could be a completely different component, right? And I think that's a good thing to bring like to, to people's uh the forefront of their mind when they're thinking about getting into info infosec or cybersecurity or security in general like one of the the key things that i would tell my wife as i was going through some of my career was this is not a 40 hour a week job this will never be a 40 hour a week <laughs> job like let me set that expectation for you and if you're coming into this thinking that you can do anything in security and 
do it on a 40, you know, 40 hour week, like take and double that. And then, and then, you know, then we can start talking. But if you don't want to work more than 40 hours and you want to show up, clock in, clock out and be done, that's not, this isn't the job. You're not going to have that passion. You're not going to be able to stay ahead. You're not going to be able to maintain the workload and, and the skill set necessary to, to be here. Right. And then take that to one additional level. Paul and I, you and I were talking about this earlier. We've taken some pretty big risks in our lives in doing some things that they weren't let me on the like, show. No, just not standard, right? You start a business, you 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 try to decide, look, I'm just gonna do my own consulting thing. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna drive, I'm gonna do that stuff. That puts a really interesting strain on a uh, on a marriage and a relationship, I'll tell you that, because I've been there, <laughs> right? To to your point, Tyler, in some respects is the wife wants stability, and then you're doing all this kind of crazy consulting stuff, and you're like, where's the revenue coming from? How do we pay our bills? But y- you learn so much from those experiences. You learn um, different techniques and different capabilities. Sorry, I was having like major headphones. I'm you, trying you to follow along. Um, just, and, 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 I think and, I'm you're, good now. and you're sitting there going, but this is, this, is what I, this is what I love. This is my passion. This is what I want to do. And, and you figure it out along the way. And if you don't have that kind of drive in you, this is a really hard industry, is, I think, yeah. to succeed. Yeah. Well, I had, I had this, a great one. Uh, is, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, most of this industry, too, like people don't realize from that, that human aspect, like you are establishing relationships and you are setting stuff up for sometimes three, four years. Like, you know, Paul, we met many, many, many years ago, and it was never anything that was – other than a professional relationship and a community. Now, just like Dave, all the relationships and the things that you've set up will lead to something in your career, and you have to realize that return on investment maybe three, maybe five, maybe seven years down the road, and all the investment of learning and having a community, showing up at the conferences, contributing to maybe one of the villages, having a special skill set that you're teaching other people, those are the community aspect of, of the security community and hacking and you don't always see a return on dividends for uh, in a monetary value until maybe five, six, right. seven years down the road. And you yeah, have to be okay with investment. not seeing those returns immediately. And, and look, a lot of you failures be okay along the with way. Like, I don't know how that works, but I'm going to go figure it out. Right. Yeah. And I, because you love to do it. And I, I want to make sure that that mindset continues, right? I mean, to Doug's point with students that are like, this is easy. I should just know. If you're willing to put, you don't have to be the best, no, right? You just have to you persevere. Gotta be will, yeah, you got to be willing to have that persistence to go. Yeah, I don't know how that works, but I'm gonna go figure it out because, you know, early in our careers and early in computing history, the way that we got to where we are today is that someone or some group of people stood up and go, "Yeah, I don't understand how that works either," but you know what? We're gonna figure it out, right? Right, and we're gonna work until we figure it out and that takes I, and lately i've been really drawing this distinction between patience and persistence because i am not a patient person but god nope. damn it i'm going to be the most persistent person right and yeah, i think i make up different. for that lack of patience with my persistence and perseverance right? my wife would say the same thing i am not a patient person not patient right <laughs> not patient i'll be frustrated through that process but i'm gonna stick with it because i know i i, wa- I want to get to the end goal right, right. And so I'm gonna, uh, I'm, I'm gonna, gonna figure it out. I'm gonna rebuild learn. the goddamn gonna... container 25 times, 50 times until <laughs> I get it right. Like there's no, there's no end in sight until I fix the problem. If you don't have that mindset, like computers and IT and security might, it might not be a thing for you, right? Like it is not a concrete thing. It's something you, you're going to be presented with problems that you're going to have to work through. And while we have Google today, which is outstanding, right, for finding the answers, <laughs> it's not always going to be on Google. You're going to have to work figure hard out. and figure it out and put it together. There's not always going to be someone you can go into a chat channel or pick up the phone or text or it, call to answer your it's problem. A bl- it's a and blessing let me tell and a you, curse. If you do, you better. What I learned and I, a blessing the people I worked with early in my career taught me was if you don't show that you have that persistence, that perseverance, that passion, and aren't willing to put the work in, and you go ask that question. I, back when I was coming up, like you, that was a bad day for you. But if you said, "I tried this, I tried this, I tried this, I researched this, and I read this," and like I either still don't understand it or I can't get to the answer, they'd be like, "Yeah, you, you put the work in, 
therefore I'm going to help you. And they may, have, may or may not have known the answer, right? If they do, they may not have told you the answer either. And I think that's what a lot of the youth of today look for is like, well, just tell me the answer. No, I'm going to tell you how you get the answer. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let you get to the answer on your own because that's the only way that you're going to learn. I do the same thing with my kids' homework today. I'm not going to give you the answer. I'm going to show you how to get there. Right. And that's Agreed. the curse, though. The curse is that you get used to just typing in, how do, right. I, how do I hack Google? And, and you, you get you know nothing. Mm. And you don't know what to do then because in, before all that, there, those things didn't exist. And, yeah, you had to go see old Lou down in the basement and go, uh, Lou. Yeah, your I? good friend Lou. And now, what I, I want to tie this into some news as well because <laughs> uh, but along these lines, but along these lines, right, Disney Plus is coming to the news for two reasons, right? One, people said the service launched and it, and, it, and it sucked and they had issues. And number two, they said, well, you know, people were trading Disney Plus accounts on the dark web as soon as it launched. Right. First of all, that's not Disney Plus's fault that you reused your passwords right. and people did password spraying. Like, uh, you know, let's just take that off the table. That's really all we need to say about that for us in this audience, right? But this, I want to highlight the other fact because it ties into hacking, right? It, Netflix built a great platform. It took them years to develop that platform, right? Amazon has a fantastic, many companies have a great platform. It took them years to build that platform. Even one of the largest, most profitable companies in the world can't snap their fingers like they do in a yeah. Marvel movie and affect change in the entire universe and say, hey, guess what? I've got the world's most fastest, reliable, and uh, you know, streaming, streaming fastest service. streaming service in the entire world. Their senior executives that come out and said, "Look, we're making updates to the code. We're making changes to our infrastructure. We realized there were issues, and we're addressing them." I and honestly like. I don't believe you can fault you launch. can't fault them, right? I thought it was good too, oh. Tyler. Right? Some people had issues. I think us in technology really need to be the the <laughs> kind of pulpit for. This, this is all part of the process. If you've not launched technology for the first time, you likely looked at what Disney and Disney Plus did and was like, well, everything else is just instant in my life. I pick up my phone and it works. I get on the internet and it works. I go to Netflix and it works. Why can't Disney just stand up a service and the first day it works? That's not how it works. Right. right? Like there's people that... Remember, Netflix used to <coughs> ship you a, a DVD, DVD in the mail... Yes. <laughs> you would watch it, then you would send, send it back, and they would send you another one before they came up with a and streaming look, service. We this can't, is, this we didn't can't, happen overnight. But we can't anticipate that demand as well. I thought they did a great job of anticipating demand. Good for them that demand was higher, right? It will take them time. They will fix the bugs. They've got lots of platforms. Lots They've of resources. Lots of They've got, got lots lot of, of hacking to do to figure out how to make it work. I think they did a great job, and I think that largely the media – which conspiracy theorists and myself says that the Amazons and Netflix of the world are paying these journalists to write these pieces that have no idea how technology works to say, well, Disney Plus platform is crap. I I, I want to call that. I want there, as, there like, are, as a security person, I just want to call that out there, and go. There, those people writing those articles, that's crap. And, and Disney did are, a great job. Look, there are there are historical points where Netflix. It took them a long time to get this stuff right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if Building you think... Building a cloud application, as we've talked about, is not... Is, is not easy. It's not. It's not easy. And we'll talk about cloud in a little bit in a couple of the articles I want to make sure we cover. But in the early days of uh, Netflix, uh, when they built their microservice, they used to check authentication like through all these microservices mm -hmm. it, which slowed down the service I, they didn't even get it right in the early days right these are learning curves that everybody's going through with Perfor digital and you know transformation what? Performance performance is a, performance and all these a other nemesis things. performance is a nemesis of security as you just articulated matt right it really is uh-huh to uh, 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 you talk about the the legs of a stool right you want it to be reliable you want it to be secure you want it to be fast. You want it to be good. Like, you only got so many legs of a stool to stand on. And right. which, which ones are you going to stand on? Because you can't have it all. It good, can't fast, be fast, cheap. Which Good, fast, two. cheap, reliable, secure. You, you got to pick, like, maybe three out, right. of, the, out of the Yeah, five, and I right? mean, Netflix yeah. has gone through this for, uh, for a period of time where they had to make improvements to their back end, 
to make the performance of the live stream happen. I mean, this stuff doesn't just happen overnight. These, these are highly complex applications to stream video. But it's not all the same things, either, right? Like if we, I go to watch Thursday Night Football, and this is a real experience that I had. Um, I went to Amazon, and Amazon's stream was terrible, and it was crashing. I'm like, all right, I'll go to... Let's go to my maybe my cable provider and my HD home run system, and that was horrible. I went to YouTube TV and everything was fine, right? Google did a, has as I've said in the in the past, Google has done a great job with YouTube TV, and so uh, all these streaming and Amazon owns the cloud that they're running the stuff from, right? And even sometimes they can't figure it out. Now their Prime streaming service is really good and very reliable as right? long as you don't and get the monetized. air when you start the and they've monetized the that right why am i going to pay a flat fee for all this content when i just want to watch this movie i can pay 3.99 and rent it or i can pay 10 to 20 dollars and buy it for something my kids are going to watch you know 20 times well worth the investment guess what it streams every time when i buy it that's it's there's a, huge. There's a lot of things that, that we're not even – that consumers are never going to consider, right? Like you have a lot of things in play in the back end between the whole internet backbone, who owns the devices, who owns the service, how right. the streaming is actually happening. That you know, we really do have to call out the media and get the media back to a, a positive kind of mindset and, and calling out the things that – from Disney standpoint, they did a great launch. That platform's yep, polished. It serves a need that was not there with content that was not readily available from a streaming platform. Mm -hmm. And for a day one launch, like let's be real, that was you know they're standing on the backs of of giants from people that have learned lessons moving forward uh, from from prior launches. Mm -hmm. So I think we really have to look and get the consumer to look past what the media is saying, call the media out too, and say. Let's be positive about some of this. Let's say there's some areas to be improved and, and call those out. But overall, like, why can't we're, – we're feeding into, as consumers, the criticism of everything. Yes. If it's not being criticized or if it's not negative or if it's not uh, someone else's misery, it's not news. It's not flashy enough. It's not uh, whatever whatever is driving – today's news or politics or negativity like let's as consumers call it back and and not feed into that that negativity and bring something but back another positive. security angle help. on that is how much this influences what we all read on the internet in terms of influencing politics right if you think about how to influence an election this is very much <laughs> it right yeah. everyone is believing what the media is writing and unless you know the underpinnings like we do in this particular case we can call bullshit but how many people are listening to us about what they've already well, read and already right. formed an opinion about, right? right? So, like, how yeah. easy or difficult is it now to shape the opinions of the masses based on basically bullshit? Well, there's so there's there's a whole lot of theory about organizational behavior that's been studied, and and if you look at these theories, you'll see that they have these times of paradigm shift that they draw as like little wiggly lines, and they say, oh, here's a standard you know behavioral pattern, and there's these weird times. And I think we're in the middle of, of a paradigm shift now where we've gone from the old world of Walter Cronkite comes on the news at yeah. 6 p.m. and you watch him and you trust him and he tells you what you think into this like crazy tabloid. You know, I like how you frame that, that. He tells you what you think. Well, that's what he did. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Today, the problem is it's that it's not that, that it's changed. It's that now we have infinite sources Yep. to tell us what to think and they all vary in what they tell us because so you go back and you listen to one person who tells you and you say okay that's what i think now we hear from all these different places and there's this paradigm shift going on that consumers are having to learn how to deal with whether it's with these platforms or it's with news or it's with anything because we really change the world really changed in the last few years in terms of of the the speed of delivery of content and mm -hmm. streaming has changed it again into that now people have trouble you almost need you know some kind of an app to help you choose what to watch there's so much content and the same as with news how do we discern and we haven't learned how to do that yet but it's a great point it it, it, it ties back into my you know we used to think trust and then verify we'd hear what's on the news we'd all trust that if you were skeptic you maybe try to go verify that right we still have that same mindset today the problem is what you're hearing at first 
is probably wrong. It's probably for someone else's agenda. We need to flip that model into verify and then trust. But, but the, largely the yeah, masses have not done that. But the paradigm shift is that it's very difficult to verify things. It is. Because yes. I can verify just about anything at this point. Yeah. You can. Uh, regardless yes. of whether it's true or not. Somebody put it up and said up is down. The world is flat. Et cetera, et cetera, the moon et cetera. landing was totally fake. And all I right? got to do you is take go any, find the right, right. site. You can right. take any notion and go find evidence on the internet to support and your notion. And the other piece of that and is that once we find it, we tend to stay in that little realm. Yeah. So we go find something that agrees with what we kind of vaguely think. I say, oh, you know, I really think that, that the world is flat. And we go find a site that says the world's flat. It's flat, man. I'm telling you. And here's why. And let me show you these, these crazy examples that don't make any sense in physics. But I'm going to tell you anyway. And then you, you tend to cling to that herd right. of people that's agreeing with you. Yeah. And it you, creates you don't, a, So you, you hop on an airplane and fly 18 hours from San Francisco to uh, Singapore and realize you don't fall off the No, they drug the you. They drug you halfway oh. through the flight. You just yeah. don't know it. There's a gas oh, that comes down. Gas. You don't remember. Oh, they turn the plane around and go back the other way, and, and it works perfectly every time. Yeah. This is going to be a big issue with, with upcoming elections and politics. Agreed. And stuff. Yep. Not to you know, not to do a self plug or anything, but one of our one of our operators, uh, Cindy Otis, uh, released a, an article on New York Times around her work with uh, fake news and and disinformation campaigns across multiple industries, uh, for not only politics or corporations, but really looking at and evaluating what information means and how we as consumers or corporations or even with politics, how do we know what is true and what is not? Uh, we're going to have to start relying more heavily on uh, analyst work and the people doing good good forensics work mm. or uh, new – we can't rely on the media anymore, right? So this disinformation uh, around politics or fake news, how do we not allow that to steer – what's happening across a whole country much less a, a whole you know world at this point mm -hmm. uh, and i think that falls a lot on us as security professionals looking at these big big issues around disinformation well, around and, and Tyler, i agree because I, I look at things that are posted on the internet and uh, i used to have a different take on them but now i look at them and go because like i used to look and say well if someone posted something and it's within my opinion it agrees with my opinion I'm like, that must be fact. Now, I look at things and I'm like, um, I verify that first. Even if it supports my opinion, you better. You've better. got to go verify, go verify that. Right? Somebody, I'm you, like, you 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 that's that, not, that couldn't be, if that's true, I got to go verify. That's not really true, right? But I think what's happening, on, especially in social media, is if someone posts something that shares the same opinion as a, a subset of the population, Everyone accepts that as true because it supports their own opinion. Right. What they have to realize and is you've got to verify that, that that's actually and marketing true. marketing tells you what you want to hear. Yes. And, and it's, there's it's, a good example of this in the news article, where, uh, the Amazon story on Capital One Breach. Mm -hmm. oh, Cause, yeah. Because I think this oh, is a great time to this. I think, I think this. this article, well, based it's on what we know and what we've aired on this show... I think this article is complete bullshit, and I think it is. a lot of things Amazon is saying <laughs> is complete bullshit, and they're covering their ass. Well, it, it, so I look at this article. Amazon tells senators isn't isn't to blame for the Capital One breach. Now, here's what, we know aspects of this, right? Amazon Insider potential vulnerability, server side request forgery, right? But what Amazon's saying, which is, look, they spun up a service and misconfigured it. So, Partly true, true, but I think there's a couple aspects here. Amazon has that inherent, air quotes, vulnerability, which is really an architectural vulnerability uh, that we described on the show. Peter Smith from Edgewise came on and, and disclosed this. We verified this, Tyler, with ourselves and others, right? This is a vulnerability in Amazon's mm -hmm. platform, right? Like this, this is really a technical thing. Uh, what what does have merit in this article is if I'm Capital One or any company, right? If I've got an uh, EC2 instance that has access to a key and I've granted it access to an S3 share, which is what I understand what happened in the Capital One breach, right? That's Capital One's fault, right? Right. Like that web app 
Should it have had access to all those records on an S3 share? Probably not. That's on Capital One. But Amazon shares responsibility in the, I'll call it an exposure that they produce that's very, very difficult to remediate, right? I don't think Amazon has really done anything to truly help customers remediate this particular vulnerability where there's an internal server. <laughs> and again, so there's a bug in Capital One's web map, but, but this EC2 instance did have access to that key that you can pull. Amazon has not remediated that exposure. But look, Maserati makes a car that'll go 130 miles an hour, and you go drive it down the freeway at 130 miles an hour, you're breaking the law. That's not Maserati's fault. That's your fault. Yeah, but what if Maserati makes the brakes that don't work all that well? well? Then, yeah, then yeah. that's Maserati's right? fault. I mean, that's so, Maserati's uh, we're fault. Split but hairs, right? But, but I think the, the 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 issue here at stake in this article is where does the responsibility lie? Yeah. And there are certain responsibilities in a shared responsibility yeah. model. I, this is a legal issue. Hey, look at it, a firearm. I, if someone makes a firearm that is prone to misfires. Is that the operator's fault? Is that the manufacturer's fault? How do you prove you say that? You should have fixed it before you, you used it. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, you could. Uh, I make bleach, right? Well, if someone chugs a gallon of bleach and they die, is that their fault or is that my fault? I mean, th I mean, this is a... <laughs> we could go down a huge rat hole here, right? right? But, but, I, but I think the, the thing we have to think about with the Capital One breach is that Amazon owns a certain part of the infrastructure a Capital One owns a certain mm -hmm. part of the infrastructure. And, and the question becomes w those lines and where is the misconfiguration of the service that it exploited this Paradigm potential attack, again. right? And, and I think this is hard for a lot of people to get wrap their heads around yeah. when you outsource your infrastructure. And, you know, when I, I look at this article and I look at Amazon's response is Amazon saying, look, I gave them a service. They misconfigured the service. It's not on me. Now, there might be a vulnerability in the service that potentially exploited this. Yep. But with the right configuration, was there a way to mitigate that vulnerability? And this is, gets into a very great but area I think, of I think, how this stuff I think happens. Peter's point when he ran this segment was it's extremely hard to mitigate the actual vulnerability. I may have exposed other vulnerabilities that give attackers access to that vulnerability, but it's kind of that whole thing like, hey, I deployed a WAF, so therefore I'm safe. Until someone can bypass my WAF, right. then they can get this well, and, vulnerability and, that it's really hard for me to implement. So is the vulnerability in the WAF or is the vulnerability in the somewhere the, the, court, the courts will ultimately have to decide or the FTC will ultimately have to decide where does that little slice fall? How yeah. much is too much? How much is not enough? So Maserati right. builds a car with no brakes. Okay, that's pretty much on them. Maserati builds a car with great brakes that you don't use properly. Okay, that's on you. So somewhere in between there, there's a place where you say, well, the, the brakes aren't effective for the power of the engine. I really, and can you just say the twitchy. term fiduciary harm? F fiduciary Fidu it's in there. It, you're, it's in there, and you're right on the cusp no, of it, it Doug. Is, and I it know is. how much you love it's that term. Fiduciary. Where is the fiduciary harm, and, 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 and who's responsible? The, and the, yeah, right? the courts ultimately have to decide where that needle lands. And I mean, and the fiduciary needle. The fiduciary needle is twitching, <laughs> <laughs> and and it twitches all around this like slice of where is the responsibility? Right. And it's a paradigm shift because nobody's dealt with a lot of these issues in the right. past. Exactly. True. And so it's like yeah, well, where automobile cars and brakes are it's a more of a well-known right but i mean it's the when same you put issue. That in the cloud yeah it, and now take it to the level of you know where you got engineers talking about the brakes right. well how good are the brakes it's not about did they not work or were they not there yes. it's about well this type of brake is is effective for this type of vehicle and if you had sat down and taken the wheels off and adjusted your brakes they would work perfectly right. if but you, you this, didn't do that use this brake fluid versus that right. other brake and it gets that all, brake it gets fluid all this, presents a vulnerability <laughs> it gets in all this twitchy capital stuff capital one used the insecure to, brake fluid so therefore yeah, yeah you're that's screwed so it's right. a brake fluid harm issue yeah yeah Pretty or much. we could just drink brake fluid and so save all everybody a lot of That's trouble. That's a great title for this episode. Brake fluid. Drink Drinking Blake, brake fluid. Brake fluid. <laughs> right here. <laughs> it's uh, Kung Fu Hobo. <laughs> Kung, Kung Fu, Fu Hobo, Hobo brake brand brake fluid. fluid. <laughs> you won't worry about Amazon anymore. It's definitely not viscous enough <laughs> to act as brake fluid. I'm just like telling you. you. Tyler, thoughts? Comments, <laughs> questions, <laughs> concerns. Tyler's like, oh, well, I'm out. On brake fluid. 
It looks like I picked I mean, the wrong week to quit sniffing glue. <laughs> the type of brake fluid you use is is more valuable than uh, <laughs> than not having brake fluid. I guess I don't, I don't even know where you guys went with that. <laughs> you need a you need a waff for your brake brake fluid is what I'm saying. Don't go all viscous on us. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh gosh! Wow, that was a rat hole. Wow. <laughs> it was. <laughs> So, but so I had to tie it into a whole little. You did. It was a great right? segue. I mean, you're 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 like Mr. Segway there. That worked. That one worked. It yeah. did. It was. I, good. I, I mean, that's what usually Josh and, and Scott. I didn't even are, know. They're I always the segues in the. I didn't even know. Show. I slipped over into another article. I was sitting. I, I, I was I sitting there. We wait, what? What the hell? No. Wait, that's the first article I'm on, on the list. Tab. Son of a bitch. It was like, <laughs> hey, how did he pull that crap? Up? Yeah. No, I was. I was impressed. Yeah. <laughs> So All right, we, where are we uh, going next? Do we hit like uh, multi-factor being targeted or Office 365 yeah. no. as targets? I like multi-factor, <laughs> multi-factor as a topic because I really think when when I, I saw this article, I was like, it really means that attackers are after our username and our password and they're after our multi-factor, which is really just another username and password. That so rather than trying to steal one set of credentials, they're, they're stealing two. It, they're out to steal the other set of credentials, and that makes perfect sense. And multi-factor has become a viscous panacea for fiduciary harm. Uh, I mean, I mean, really. <laughs> I mean, you, you see this all the time now. It's like every problem, the answer is multi-factor authentication, and and every, and, and all these C-level people are like multi-factor. We got to have multi-factor, right. and then we'll have no more don't, risk. Don't make the attackers steal one set of credentials. Make steal them two. steal two, two, and that will slow them down. Yeah, just take a couple. Yeah, I mean that's a that's a great point though. It's it's become the silver lining for everything. And as organizations are deploying this, and they're they're putting all of their eggs around multi-factor, mm-hmm. they really do need to understand a lot of the the caveat risks with it and how some of the configurations are set up, what the attackers are actually going after with, with the multi-factor. Uh, just because it has multi-factor doesn't mean there's a, you know, not a way around it, not uh, an abuse. We're not enumerating users for proper uh, user lists. It can be finding accounts that have not been set up and then setting them up, uh, you know, if we get the password right and that account wasn't set up, well, then we still have multi-factor, but it's our multi-factor, and we're using the the tool how it's designed to be used. But and I, then you I have really, all the legacy stuff. I really think it's a it's still just a band-aid, right? I mean, not to it is. like get all philosophical, but if you could come up with a reliable way, and I think there are technologies there are that exist. To do that. Reli- you, Matt, you know what I'm calling, right? A reliable way to verify the identity of the user. Let's be honest: username and password are not it. A multi-factor in a lot of cases is not is just another set of credentials, right? What we really need is a way to verify that the user is really who they say they are. So many different technologies exist today that do that so much better than a user that has a username and a password and even a physical multi-factor, if this is like a physical multi-factor key, right? And, and, and that's looking at behaviors. It's looking at a dozen data points rather than just a username, a password, and something that is texted to my phone. Right? But, we, but we still have social security numbers. Yay. <laughs> so, Yay. I mean, th- this is a common problem that, that you but run into I, even I, outside of our industry, right? Like there are technologies and there's great solutions out there that that would fix this around identity and, and proving who you are not you know not just even around social security numbers or username and password like there are systems out there that people have thought out designed and tested it's end user adoption and ease of use right at the but end of the day but it's it also is. the provider adoption of those technologies right this is true i it, it, it's we've gotten some listener feedback that you know, live in other countries in, in Europe, and they're like, look, our country has adopted this system. It's passwordless authentication. It identifies me as a user for everything that we access inside of our country. I'm like, that's I, those systems are awesome, and I applaud them. They've had vulnerabilities, and they fix them, and I think it's great. But if you put a Nest or any IoT device inside of your home, yep. you now have another password. That doesn't, uh, I, again, that doesn't identify your PII or you personally, but it's yet another system that could lead 
to other attacks. It is because it's, yeah. it's not fiduciarily sound for those companies to deploy those when they're <laughs> trying to keep their budgets low. Another for set of credentials that, that could <laughs> lead to your uh, identity. Right, being and, and we know that there's attacks out there on some of these other platforms to get this. So. Let's say that um, I have multi-factor in place, but the multi-factor is an email to you with the right. token in it. And But I already have compromised your email because I compromised your email through phishing. I already have your credentials because I phished you. Now I can also potentially see in your email. I, I already have your sec I have your I have your account, username, password. And, oh, by the way, I have insight into your email to grab that token out of your email mm -hmm. or off of your phone through SIM attacks and other things that we've seen already. So iMessaging. Right. Mm -hmm. So we've already seen these other attack mechanisms that if I have your username and password, if you're sending the password to your phone, I could potentially get it. If I, I'm sending that second token to your email, I could potentially get it. Holy cow. You're co fully compromised in those multi-factor scenarios versus maybe a hard token, which is a lot harder to go hack. Um, but so we've deployed these mechanisms, right, that also allow attackers to not only get your credentials through an email fish, but potentially also can go get the second factor because I'm in your email and or... I'm doing something on your phone, and, and now I can pull all the data And it can even together. be worse because if, if you put too much trust in those things, uh, I saw a case where they had a hard token, and the person's laptop got stolen. And they had actually downsized some of their monitoring because they said once we put these tokens in place, there's very little risk of compromise, and somebody left their laptop sitting on a table in a restaurant, and the guy grabbed it and ran off with it. And now it's like, well, can he just get in with the token? Yeah. It, and how quickly can you invalidate that token that's what well they had to becomes. know it was gone and of and course you know it it, when the consultant got it he's like oh wait let me call somebody but i don't know the numbers i'll have to wait till i drive back in and hours and hours and hours it becomes went by. A process right and now. if that guy had a, a chance to jump in there and put a new account in the system you know in fact uh, i showed them that it with that system i could have requested a new hard token mailed to me mm. And I could have just made up one and had it mailed to my house. And, and now they don't even know. And it was an automated system. And it, he invalidates it. But two days later, I get my nice fresh token in my house with a fake account I created. Right. And, and so this leads into this whole second, uh, this other article. I hacked my accounts using my mobile number because now you can do the whole SIM swapping thing if you have the cell phone number, right? Yeah. And so let's say I go out and I do a really sophisticated OSINT. And, and look, we talked about this earlier on the mm -hmm. webcast today. I can go grab all this data. I get your mobile number. I have your second token. If your second token is going to your phone, because now I can do SIM swapping and pull that token off because I've already compromised your credentials. Boom. That second token that's getting texted to you, you think is secure, and all of a sudden, somebody else with a SIM swapping attack now has access to that. Boom, they're in. Well, and they have to social <coughs> engineer your cellular provider and... That varies depending on who your cellular provider is and what protections they have in place. Typically, there is a PIN number that before you make any of those changes will prompt you for that PIN number before they do that. Now, there's ways around Unless that. Unless the PIN's printed on your, uh, on your uh, bill and they dumpster dive you. The pin sh it is. should be. Oh, similar. it is. Let me tell you, I could I could show you two different services that do that right now. I had one today. I was calling them, and on their recorded message, it was like your pin number is printed in the upper right corner of your bill. Mm -hmm. I, if I just called them, I'm like, wow. Anybody? And, and this was a, a provider. It wasn't here. It was actually I was doing it for somebody else. It it means every single person that uses that service gets a bill every month in the mail. That means every single mailbox in that town. They use that service, gets a bill on the same day of every month. I could literally drive through neighborhoods and grab every single bill because they all get mailed at the same time. But what, if it's, what if it's an e-bill? What if it's an e-bill? Well, then it's in your email then box. Then it's in your email box, which you potentially already have access to through a, a crafted phishing campaign. Yep. But, I mean, if the customers don't opt for that, <coughs> and I mm. guarantee you some of them don't, 
I go around opening mailboxes, I can just dumpster dive you and get that PIN number and guess where they probably use that? They use that PIN number everywhere. And I mean, that's, that's terrifying. Yeah, it's, it's probably the same one you use for your debit card. And, all and these other yeah, things, right? and your company token and everything right. else. So exactly right. Right. I mean, that's just terrifying stuff to me. And it's just poor, it's just poor management of the whole thing. It could be the last, last four digits of your yeah, social yeah. security number, which no one knows. Oh, right. Nobody ever gets those, yeah. Well, this goes back to the the whole getting the consumer to switch their their mindset and having that, you know, like we said, the, almost like a credit score for companies where it does become a marker for people to purchase or uh, between choosing between companies and makes it a competitive edge. Because at this point, security costs more. It's not great for the companies from a business standpoint it costs more it, it has its rewards from a reputational standpoint sometimes but we're seeing even those companies are getting out of it and blaming it on apt or blaming it on the next sophisticated thing or blaming it on their providers right like these are things that uh from a consumer standpoint to affect a whole lot of change we really have to find a way to get a lot of consumers that may not be technically savvy uh behind a movement that then shifts companies and forces them to buy in and adopt these security practices and, and want to push these out for their consumers. Right. And nobody wants to ship a consumer a, a, a hard physical, token, yeah. a physical hard token. That's the challenge, right? Yeah. Things like, things like Windows Hello, though, I think, is, I think Windows Hello is like a great example of how you start to push that, right? Like Windows is a desktop platform that's, you know, got the market pretty well uh, in its pocket and they're they have an option. They're not forcing everybody, but this Windows Hello allows you to adopt it and have a completely password-free uh, means of authentication that's cryptographically sound when it's deployed right. And, and this Google, can go across know, organizations. Google's done something similar in building in the U2F device into their yes. Chromebooks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so but that I mean, also I means you have to like trust that are these coming. organizations, right? And I mean, Hello <laughs> is certainly an example of stuff that's coming along right. that's going to... When we get to the phone, though, you seem to see people latch on to SMS and text messages, but yeah. of course there's better options for that in an authenticator app and, and other such things that are storing it in the secure storage on the phone, right. which isn't 100%, obviously nothing is, but isn't 100% effective, but still, I think, better than SMS. We're learning. Yeah, we're learning. I yeah. mean, it's just a we're slow still, process. We're, we're still behind. We're putting a lot of faith and a lot of effort and a lot of... Uh, resource behind all these major corporations though to bring a solution that is you know all the eggs in one basket right like windows hello or yeah. azure mfa or you know duo security like we're putting a lot of faith in the fact that a that these companies have our best interests at hand and what they're doing is uh you know crypt cryptographically sound or you know has security best practices and their business model on the back end for attackers coming after them because they own all the keys of the kingdom like ensuring that that is is well done and they're being secure and we're not as as a whole we have a very limited number of companies that we're relying and putting a lot of faith in you know aws azure how many of these platforms house most of what we do from a day-to-day -day basis for a service, uh, an application, our our day-to-day -day life, email, our business, uh, our entire you know platform as a service? Like these are, <laughs> there's very few companies. So we're we're starting to move to that decentralized uh, or that centralized state in which I think at some point we're going to have to decentralize again. Uh, the the last article I wanted to cover is uh, from Threat Post. And it's a growing list of D-Link bugs that they won't fix. They've created routers, <laughs> firmware, yeah. has vulnerabilities, and they're like, yeah, it's unsupported. I'm not going to fix it. Now, let's take that back to your car example, Doug. I produce cars. It's got problems with the brakes. And I'm your car's in the play. It. Not going to recall it. Not going to fix oh, it. I'll give you an example. Ford Pinto. It's a famous business case. Ford knew that the Pinto was dangerous, that when it encountered a certain kind of collision, that it burst into flames, and the people tended to either be horribly burned or die. And Ford did a calculation on what it was going to mm -hmm. cost them to fix the problem and recall all the vehicles versus what they were going to have to pay out in damages. And they found that it was cheaper just to pay the damages. And it's a famous business case. Right. And I think that's the same thing you got here. It's what are we going to have to pay out? So what's our liability? 
and what is it going to cost us to fix all these chips and completely replace the hard firmware in a hundred million devices and the companies did a just hard cold capitalistic calculation and said and this is even easier for them because it's not like people being burned to death it, yeah but can't the in the case of dealing to ftc in the case of automobiles the what is the governing body uh, uh ntsb yes ntsb come out and say yeah no if you're not going to fix that we're going to find you they can but they never have they haven't interesting well it, ftc has not enough i think to make an impact but they have They've done some stuff on, like, the smart TVs and some other stuff. And, 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 right. router, and router manufacturers, but then, and too. And that's part of the calculation. I mean, that's part, in the yeah. formula. They're calculating so, in the right. formula. It is a risk calculation at the end of the day, right? They're calculating the the cost of fix versus the cost of mitigation and, and uh, potential liability. And they're running those calculations. They're saying, look, it's cheaper for us to pay out the fines than it will be potentially to recall 100 million devices and replace those, so we'll take our bets. It's, it's the speeding dilemma. I mean, almost everybody speeds at some point. I mean, there's very mm -hmm. few people that drive out here. I mean, the speed limit on the street out there is probably 30 miles an hour. Everybody's going five miles over, seven miles over, whatever. And people calculate the risk of getting caught right. and the penalty. I mean, I if a speeding ticket resulted in a $100,000 fine, 50 years in prison, and, and you'd never be allowed to drive again, people probably wouldn't speed. But nobody wants that, so there's this trade-off between okay. Security. Well, I mean, security's always been a, a business risk decision, yeah. right? Like, at the end of the day, all the companies are out to make money. We're a capitalist economy. It's a business decision whether or not doing security will cost us more and is worth the reputational or whatever damages, monetarily, long term. That decision is always come back to the business, which it should be. It's called acceptance um, of risk. I mean, yep. you just say, I'm, I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, Tyler breaks in my building every single time he comes there and he gets in and I go, it's just not worth it to fix. So we don't do it. <laughs> we just accept the risk and say, oh, well, that's that's the way it goes. And and Ford decided that with a Pinto and, and, and companies decide that with their firmware because they go, what's it going to cost us to recall a hundred million thermostats that we've sold over the last 50 years? Yep. And it cost forty five dollars, and and we made yeah, twenty dollars right. off. And of the on the other hand, how many times are we going to be sued? And somebody sits down and figures that out, and they say, "Here's our estimate," and they go, "Yeah, it's just not worth it. Just leave it, get over it, accept the risk." I guess mm. what if an attacker decided that they were just going to brick every single D Link that was vulnerable? Well, then D Link would probably do something about it. Or would they? Or, or would the would people they? go out and buy new routers? They just release they, a, just new, a new, new router. They aren't D-Link. <laughs> they just say, we'll release a new router, and and, and they never mention it again. Mm -hmm. And your router would got that bricked. that be a vigilante move? Right. That's what I'm, that's what <laughs> well, I'm getting at. D-Link releases it and says, you know, send right. your old router in. And if people illegal. Bother, illegal. I yeah, don't do that. That's not illegal. permission. Cases. <laughs> yeah, get permission before you destroy I the world. Was the, the I think it was the D-Link and might allow you. Was it the lion worm? There's case law that has been established in that vigilante realm where you try and release a good worm uh it, that does the good worm doesn't exist right it's still a violation yeah. of the cfaa so yep. it's the it's still lands yeah. you in an orange jumpsuit even if in this case you did that and bricked everyone's router that right. was vulnerable and you say i'm a good guy i was trying to prove a point yeah, no yet you're still going to jail yeah and but somebody's going to do it from a country outside the u.s break all the routers and and it, it, not get prosecuted because they're in some other country. Well, I mean, because the they can the see the vulnerabilities, they're going to lock it all some, down. Someone or some machine. I, right. Ooh. It could be a machine. <laughs> yeah. When, when an AI says, I'm going to teach you guys a lesson. <laughs> right. You stupid humans. You're so reliant on all these silly Is that things. how Skynet gets started? That's right? exactly how Skynet gets started. <laughs> That's actually how the Terminator in the real world ends. Yes. They just brick everybody's thermostat and they all die from heat stroke because they don't know what to do. <laughs> That was the less interesting version of that movie. Right. <laughs> In the alternate universe. <laughs> My blender won't stop. God, what am I going to do? <laughs> Throw in more ice. More ice. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to drink till we die. <laughs> we just um, make cocktails constantly. I just, it's okay. I've had so many margaritas, I don't know what to do. Yeah, right. <laughs>
Oh, no, frozen. martinis require shaking, not, not blenders. Although a frozen martini would be an interesting cocktail that I have not heard of before, oh, yeah. Johnny. That oh, would be a challenge. If you added ice and vodka and, and olive it. juice into your blender you and made it, it into a frenzy. I, ooh. It put some pickles in there, some olives well, in so there. My wife, so my wife's watching right now. And I, she told me to wink at her, but... Um, she likes ice chips. What a better way to get ice chips than to blend the whole uh, martini yeah. in the blender I and think then pour we're the ice something. chips on. Uh, uh, we're going to have to try I think for the Christmas party. <laughs> I'm going to blend a martini, Morty. We're going we're to do frozen it. martinis. I'm going to blend it, Morty. I'm going to blend a martini. <laughs> I'm going to put some pickles on the top. And I, I'm going to put ice chips in it, Morty. And it's going to be great. And we're going to spend 100 years finding that frozen martini, Morty. <laughs> and then I'll show you what true level really means. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy and with that that will conclude the show thank you everyone for listening and watching Doug take us out oh well I guess that just about wraps it up here at, uh, at old home week and uh, I want to thank all my friends out there and they're, they're playing the music so I guess I'm going to have to shut up now but I wanted to start off by saying no I'll, I'll quit so over and out